list has been a long awaited day. For the last seven years, this body of believers has been made making a great investment in time and money and blood and sweat and tears. The building of the addition to the Little White Church has been a true labor of love to better prepare us and enable us to extend the love and kindness of mer and mercy of our God to those in our communities. We tend to think of this building as the spiritual house, and in a way it is. Jesus uh, said, my house shall be a house of prayer for all the nations. But perhaps, according to Peter, it would be better to say that this building's purpose is to serve and house the spiritual household of God as they join in the work of His great plan to reconcile the world to Himself. Let's pray. Father, as we look at your word this morning, open our eyes, Lord, open the eyes of our heart to see and understand what our place in all this is. Lord, how you have moved from a temple of stones to a temple of living stones. And that we are they. We are them. Father, I pray that you would move in us to help us be all that we should be. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Peter describes a spiritual house. 1 Peter 2 paints a picture that's very appropriate for us today on our dedication day for the addition that we've been working on. It speaks of a spiritual house, yet as often as as is often the case in Scripture, it's not exactly what we think. And coming to Him as to a living stone, rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer a spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the living one because of his resurrection. Death and the tomb could not keep him. And he's called the cornerstone by the prophets and by the psalms. So Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, joins the two together and calls Jesus the living stone. And because the redeemed take on the characteristics of the Redeemer, Peter says they also are living stones. What does God do with these living stones? In the days of the early church, people build their houses out of stones. When, when uh, the New Testament describes a carpenter, it doesn't necessarily mean someone who works with wood. He could have easily been a stonemason. They were all carpenters. And those stone masons, those builders, would always be on the lookout for a certain stone, the perfect stone that would cap the walls and the corners to hold the roof beams and to join the walls all together. In like manner, with Jesus as the top cornerstone, God is building a house out of these living stones. A spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer him genuine worship. The world scoffs at such a house, just as they scoffed at Jesus, the cornerstone. We don't need or want this cornerstone, they say. We're sufficient in ourselves. Not realizing that the houses that they build will all be destroyed. We have no desire to be part of this spiritual house, they say, not realizing that the spiritual house is the only one 
that will survive into eternity. How do the prophets in the Psalms address all this? For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. And he who believes in him shall not be disappointed. Peter speaks of a structure built by God himself. God laid a cornerstone in the heavenly city. And the cornerstone is the Lord Jesus Christ. He said he went to prepare a place for us. I can tell you there's no disappointment in him. There are many times that I have trusted him to provide or make a way. And I have never been disappointed. Because he's faithful and able. Never been disappointed. It's interesting in, in Zechariah 4 7, when Zerubbabel finally finishes the temple, Ezra's temple, when he places the capstone, the final capstone on the structure, you know what he said? Grace. Grace to it. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, the capstone on the true spiritual temple. This precious value, then, is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they're disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. So the great worth of the cornerstone is realized only by believers. Only by those who follow in the steps of the faith of Abraham. There are many who say, Jesus is of no practical worth to me. I can take him or leave him. And maybe in your heart, you feel this way this morning. It's because you misunderstand the word belief. For you, it's only theoretical, not experiential. Amen. You've never <clears throat> trusted in Jesus to provide and make a way for you. Consequently, He's not precious to you. But for those who have believed and experienced Him, He is precious and becomes more so as time and experience go on. To those who disbelieve, meaning those who refuse to trust Him, the cornerstone is not only not precious, but He's also offensive. Through the Scriptures, Jesus makes claims on them that disbelieve, and they rebel at those claims. Scriptures proclaim his ownership of them, but they respond, no, he doesn't own me. I own me, and no one else. Thus, they're offended, and they stumble at the cornerstone. And by doing so, they seal their own doom. How is it that you seal your own doom? It's when you forsake the only way out of your fallen condition. And if you die that way, you're going to spend eternity in hell. But believers are different. They live on a different plane. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possessions, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. A spiritual house which is built of living stones as the true house of worship. What is it really? 
He says it's a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. And these people have a purpose, to proclaim the excellencies of Him, the excellent one, and to point others to Jesus Christ. He's the excellent one. He's the solution to this present darkness, this world where family relationships are torn apart by strife, where lives collapse under the weight of alcohol and drug abuse, where hopelessness leads to resignation, depression, and suicide, and where idolatry leads to a total waste of life. He's the one who called us out of this darkness into his marvelous light to make the proclamation, Jesus is precious and excellent. Hosea's children were given names that represented these prophetic words. His uh, second child, a girl, was named Lo Ruhama, meaning not receive mercy. And his third child, the boy, was rece received the name Lo Ami, meaning not my people. They were renamed under the power and the grace of God in Hosea chapter 2, verse 1. They were named Ami and Ruhamah, my people. And you've received mercy. Likewise, the people of God have been given a new name, a new identity, a new nature, a new heart. Once we had not received mercy, now, because of Jesus and His cross, we have received mercy. Just as Abraham was told by God to leave Haran, go to a new land, and he obeyed and left and became a stranger and an alien for the rest of his life, God also tells us that we have to leave our Haran, which is this world system which strives on fleshly lusts, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life are of the world, not from God. And these things wage war on you and destroy your own soul, which is meant to be filled with the light of God. Instead, those fleshly lusts always fill you with darkness. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. So what are some applications? Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers they may on account of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God on the day of visitation. What is, it, what is acceptable or excellent behavior? As unbelievers observe excellent behavior over time, Peter says they come to a knowledge of God. And unbelievers are prone to misinterpret this excellent behavior and speak evil about it. But what is it like, this excellent behavior? It's the beautiful life of righteousness. It's a living out of the Sermon on the Mount kind of life. It's a life empowered by grace. It's a life where truth is spoken and it's couched in agape. It's a life where Christ is precious and His Word is kept and spoken. And when people see this kind of life, this excellent behavior, who knows? They might come to understand who God is. These people are the spiritual house built by God. 
And Jesus Christ himself is the cornerstone laid by God. So don't confuse the spiritual house with the physical house. The physical house is a tool to be used by the spiritual house to display the excellencies of Jesus Christ. And to help others correctly interpret this excellent behavior. So that they also may become ready for the return of the King. The Lord Jesus Christ. I do you come and lead us in our lives. To better proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness into light. The building itself is not the light, but it serves to showcase the light. The building itself is not the spiritual house, but it's meant to serve those who are the spiritual house. The building itself is not the true house of God, but it's meant to enable the holy priesthood to proclaim His word and to extend the kindness and mercy of God to a lost and needy world. So today, this afternoon, we'll dedicate this edition to God's service and to the excellencies of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Our vision statement is to communicate the message of the cross in our own flesh to every person in the heart of the hills. May the grace of God, which includes His provision of this facility, not prove to be in vain, but by His grace, will do as He told us. In Jesus' name.